So now, what we're going to do is, I've been here for about a year, and over the past year, I've been establishing, establishing several main points. One of them being is that uh, God is a good God. He's not an angry God. He's not a religious God. He wants relationship. I've been establishing that. Uh, I've been establishing the fact that salvation is, is believing on Jesus, what he did at the cross, and receiving that free gift of salvation. I've established that it's not based on what you do, on what he's done. Uh, we've established that we're under a new covenant. We're not under the old covenant. A lot of people mix the covenants. How many know there's two covenants? There's the old covenant and the new covenant. We've been over that extensively. Um, and a lot of people mix the covenants, unfortunately. They'll say, okay, once all your sins are forgiven up until you got saved. But once you get saved, then it's time for you to really work hard and buckle down and try your best to please God. It's, it's a mix of covenants, okay? And it just destroys people. So we've talked about that. Now, what we're, we've mentioned a lot of other things about the grace of God, the love of God, um, many different things. Now we're going to kind of, we're going to still go, we're definitely still, that's our foundation. But now we're going to get into Christian fundamentals. Okay, things like daily reading of the word, discipleship, giving, um, baptism, uh, very simple basics. We're going to get down, and the reason why I want to start focusing on these things now is because we have a foundation that God's a good God. Because a lot of these things, reading the word, prayer, um, um, discipleship, going to church, a lot of those things the church religion has used to abuse people, saying if you don't do these things, God's mad at you and he's going to punish you. But we've established God's a good God. He's not, he's not out to get you. But now because of relationship with him, now we are empowered to do, the, do these things. We're empowered to read the word. If we are born again, we should have a desire to be baptized. Different things like that. Um, so we're, we're going to get into that. And then along the same lines, we're still going to continue in the goodness of God, the grace of God, and in knowing Him and knowing His love for us. So, <clears throat> the very and also, too, we're going to talk about end times as well. Um, I've been doing a lot of study on the end times, and it's so interesting. We talked a little bit about it last week. <laughs> and just, uh, I, if you're an avid follower of the news and current events, I encourage you to keep your eyes on temple, the rebuilding of the temple. Follow as much news as you can on that. Very interesting stuff going on right now. Like I mentioned, um, they have all of the, the, the utensils, everything they need for, for the daily ministry in the, in the temple. They've finished all that. They're anticipating. They even have the cornerstones cut out for the temple. They're just waiting. And the problem was before is that uh, the, the Dome of the Rock is on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem where they want to build the temple. And the, the it, uh, Muslims are like, no, you cannot rebuild the temple here. There's a lot of conflict. But what's very interesting, at this day, this hour, there's Muslims, prominent Muslims, calling for the rebuilding of the temple. Now, this may be a, a PR move, it looks like, to kind of maybe bring peace. But their, their motive, their goal, their goal, the, the Muslims who want to rebuild the temple, their goal is to bring back what they believe is their Messiah. They call him the Mahdi. And um, he's an exact exact mirror of what we what the Bible describes as the Antichrist. So we're going to get into that. Things like that. Very interesting stuff. Um, and I encourage you to study out if you're interested in it. But the very first thing that I want to establish, that I want to go over, that I want to emphasize today is daily reading of the Word. Reading the Bible. Okay, the Bible, it's the most powerful book in existence. Okay, um, think, got it all set? Okay, thank you. Um, the, the Bible is, I, I like to tell a little story. Voltaire, does anyone know about the French philosopher Voltaire? Okay, he, he actually said that with, because of my intellect and my superior thinking and then how I'm discipling people, in a hundred years, we will have no, no need for the Bible and its foolishness. That's what he said. And, he, and this was around the, the uh, 17th, around like 1780, something like that. Am I, am I right about that, John? <laughs> um, and he, he was saying that in a hundred years that there will be no need for the Bible because man's evolving so much and we're so much smart, smarter than the Bible. Well, anyway, a hundred years after his death, the, um, there was an institution that actually took his house and started using a, a, a started printing Bibles there. <laughs> so that's God showing, no, the Bible was spreading even more a hundred years from his death. Okay? Uh, it was, it's just the, the Bible is... is the best-selling book of all time. 
I mean, continuously, the best-selling book, best-selling book. This, it's, it's, this book, it's the Word of God, it's His heart, it's His thoughts, okay? And it says that the Word of God is living really and active, we're going to get into that. Okay, the, but what I want to emphasize is daily reading of this Word. And like I said before, you can make it a religious ritual. And I did for several years. I said, if I don't read my five chapters a day, I'm going to lose my anointing. Or <laughs> I'm going to lose the blessing. Or I'm going to lose something. But no, reading the Word, it, it's, it's food to us. It's life to us. When I first got saved, um, I had a strong, strong desire to read the Word. I mean, it was just, I went... Like within the first day or two, I went to the Christian books. Well, first I went to that to the church that I was having the soup kitchen where I got saved at, and um, I went into the church and I said, "Where does Jesus talk in the Bible?" And a, a good buddy of mine, he said, "You see the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see those these Gospels? That's where Jesus talks." And I said, "I want to read these Gospels." And he said, "Go get yourself a Bible at the Christian bookstore, a nice study Bible." So I did that, went there, and I just dove into the Word. I was so excited about coming home from work and getting into the Word. It was crazy. Um, it was kind of like that same excitement that I had before I was saved about like a Friday or Saturday night before a party. You know what I mean? You have that anticipation, that excitement. It, but it was, like, it was like that, but so much greater. I was waiting. I was thinking about going home and getting into the Bible. And, and it was, I was just so hungry, so thirsty for the Word, learned so much. But then I turned it into that religious ritual. And then, after I turned it into a religious ritual, then slowly but surely I kind of stopped. And, and, and I've had the worst times, and I'm just testifying right here, I've had the worst times in my life when I've stopped reading the Word. When I'm not daily taking in the Word. I mean, my life has just fallen apart. Now, I'm not going to say that if you're not reading the Word, your life's a mess. No, that was just, that was, that, that was, I know because I was building such a foundation in my life as a Christian on the Word. And when I stopped, it was just, it was really bad. But what I want to establish today, if you're, if you're a born-again believer and you're not reading the Word, I want to encourage you. It is crucial, absolutely crucial. Now, I'm not going to put something on you and say, well, you've got to read your five chapters a day. If it's just one verse a day, you know, that's pretty simple. But if it's just one verse a day, you make a habit out of it, it will change your life. It will radically change your life. So... We're going to, um, the first verse we're actually going to go through is, and it's the only verse, is uh, second, two verses, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, okay, <clears throat> and this is talking about scripture and taking it in, verse 16, if you have your Bible, you can turn there or just look up here with me, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and I like some translations, actually say all scripture is God breathed. Okay, because so that's actually what this inspiration that's you can interchangeable in the Greek inspiration and God breathed. What else did God breathe into? Life. Man, yes, life. He also breathed into man. So the scripture is God breathed, it's inspired by God and is profitable. So that we're, we're going to focus on each one of these things. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and it says man, it means woman also, the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So there's a lot in there. Okay, profitable for doctrine. And, and, and this doctrine is what some of the things we're going to talk about above, like the daily reading of the Word. Uh, what, what the Word says about baptism. What the Word says about healing. What the Word says about uh, giving. Okay? It's profitable for a doctrine. And, the, and, and we get our doctrine from the Word of God. Not from man's, man's, uh, um, man's doctrines. For reproof. So reproof is proof and evidence. Proof, conviction, and evidence. That's what reproof means. For correction. Alright? The Word of God corrects. It doesn't condemn. That's, that's the major difference we need to focus on. It doesn't say the Word of God for condemnation. It says for correction. And I just want to take a second to focus on the difference between correction and condemnation. Condemnation kills. Okay? And how many of you know what condemnation is? It's, it's when, when, when if you make a mistake and someone says you've blown it, you're done, 
you, you're worthless thing, you're, you're never going to make it back. That's condemnation. Correction is, is saying, you know what, let's take this course. You can, you can uh, um, re-equip yourself. You can, you can head in a diff different direction. You are better than this. Correction actually helps you. It builds you up. So the Word of God does not condemn, but unfortunately a lot of people use the Word of God to condemn people. They think that condemnation will change people. It doesn't. It kills people. It hurts people. Correction, on the other hand, helps people. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote in the epistles, he was correcting people a lot. The Galatians, he corrected them. He even said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You've fallen from grace. Okay, and, and that does not mean that they've sinned. It means that they were trying to live under the law again. The Apostle Paul corrected the Corinthians multiple times for the type of uh, lifestyle a lot of them were living. So there, there is correction, but he wasn't condemning them. He wasn't saying, you guys are Christians, and now you're going to go to hell because of the mistakes you made. So the Word of God, that's, that's important to establish right now. The Word of God does not condemn, it corrects. Okay? It produces correction. And correction is healthy. Correction is good. It's good for us. Our Father will correct us. He doesn't correct us with cancer. He doesn't correct us with sickness. He corrects us with what? The Word. That's what it says up here. Nowhere does it say that He'll correct us with all kinds of pain and suffering and things like that. The Word corrects us. The Word corrects our hearts and our direction. So, <clears throat> why do we get into the Word? To be complete and thoroughly equipped for this life. Okay, so this is all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Then we can take that as to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you can take that, and if you kind of look at it the other way, if we're not in the Word, we won't be thoroughly equipped. Okay, we won't be equipped for this life. And again, I'm not, I, I, this is kind of like a correction. If, if, if you're not daily reading the Word, look at, this is not condemnation, this is correction. But we're going to get into the fact that the Word of God, it is just, I, I have seen it go do so much in my life. I've, I've seen it just transform people's lives, transform my life. It is amazing. Okay, so I'm, I'm encouraging you, get into the Word, get into the Word. And I'll, I'll, I'll give like some, some helpful pointers on where to start and things like that. Okay, so you could now if we receive all things when we're saved. So when this is saying thoroughly equipped, it doesn't, it doesn't, if you're born again, it doesn't mean that you have to read this to get, to get something from God. When you got saved, you received Jesus, you received the fullness of His grace on the inside of you. You became in Christ, and Christ is in you. So you received everything He has. However, what this word does, it helps you, it shows you what you have. Think of this as your book of inheritance, okay? If you don't know the inheritance you've been given, you won't access it. But this book, the Bible, shows you what you've been given. So I'm going to give an example. Let's say you're struggling, and I have this in my notes, let's say you're struggling with worry and anxiety, okay? It's not so much of asking God, God, please give me your peace. Please give me your peace. If you're born again, He is on the inside of you, and He is your peace. His peace is already there. So what the Bible does, you take a verse like, like uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to go there really quick. Uh, Philippians 4. Or maybe it's 2. I'm really bad with addresses. I'll just, I don't know where it's at, but it says, Be anxious for nothing, but all things with prayer and supplication, present a request to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So you take that verse, and you start meditating on it, you start thinking on it, and saying, Thank you, Lord, that your peace, which surpasses understanding, is guarding my heart and my mind. See, what you're doing is you're, think, you're, you're taking the word, you're thinking on what you already have, and then it begins to release. Does everyone see that? Four, that's, six, and seven. I'm sorry? Four, six, and seven. Four, six, and seven. Thank you very much. That's four, uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. If you want to write that down and memorize it or make that part of your arsenal. So, <clears throat> the word of God helps us access what's in us. That's my main point. It's like a combination, I guess, for lack of better terms. It's the combination. The Word of God helps you unlock what's already been provided, what's already in you. There's so many promises in here. So many promises. And you know what he said to all of his promises? 
I believe it's in 1 Corinthians, it says, for all the promises of God in Him, in who? Who is that? In Christ, in Jesus. For all the promises of God in Him, Jesus, are yes and amen. See, a lot of times people go, well, I don't know if it's God's will or not. If it's a promise, it's yes and amen. That's what the Word says. Okay? And why is it saying Christ? Because God's looking at Christ to say yes and amen. He's looking at His perfection, not your works. He's looking at what Jesus did to say. He's saying right now to Jesus, yes and amen. All the time. Yes, amen. He's our intercessor. So if He's doing that and you're in Christ, what is He saying to you? Yes, amen. To all of His promises. Now, people cannot use the Word of God for something that He didn't promise, but guess what? He promised us so many good things. Anything you can think of that you need for this life, to get through this life, and to bring in this life, God has provided for you. Not that He wants you to get through, He wants you to reign in life. It says in uh, Romans 5.17. And how do you reign in life? It says because you've received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You don't reign in life through trying, you reign in life through receiving. Okay? Romans 5.17, very powerful verse, very powerful. So, the Word of God helps you unlock what God has already given you. So that's why it's crucial. That's why it's very important in our lives, to make it a part of our lives. Okay, reading the Word is the most crucial element in the, in the life of a believer. It is. It is the most, not coming to church, not coming to a building, not... Um, <clears throat> Uh, doing all, all the, you know, a lot of giving. Giving's important, but giving, things like that. See, because all these things come from the Word. A foundation in the Word. The Word shows you who you are. The Word shows you who God is. The Word shows you God's will. A lot of people question God's will. They don't know God's will. What is your will, O oh Lord? You know, I've been there, for sure. I've been there. What, what, do you, what do you want to do? What are your plans? It's in here. It's, so, it's spelled out so plainly. But see, so many Christians don't get into the Word. And they have that kind of, oh, what's, oh. Like one of the, I hate this statement. Have you ever said it? I'm not mad at you. But I hate this statement. God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> That's religious garbage. Okay? He's not a mystery. He's revealed himself to us. If he was a mystery, in 1 John chapter 5 it says that he has given us an understanding that we may know him. He's not some mysterious being that's saying, I don't want them to know me. I want them to kind of be scared, a little bit of, you know, I want them to worry a little bit about me. And kind of. That's not God. He's revealed himself through Christ. Okay? He's a good God. And he's given us all these things. It's just, religion is just the enemy of God. The religious spirit, I should say, because James does talk about the pure religion of giving and blessing people. The, the religious spirit that the Pharisees had, that Jesus rebuked often. Okay, he wasn't, notice he wasn't rebuking sinners, he was always rebuking the religious Pharisees who were condemning everyone. So, the religious spirit, what it does is it places, it tries to replace the Holy Spirit with the flesh. Works of the flesh, do's and don'ts, and we've been over that extensively. Um, many believers don't read the word on a regular basis, and it shows. It shows. It may show in your life. I, it has <coughs> shown in my life when I'm not reading the word on a regular basis. It is very evident the way I respond to people, the way I talk, the, what I watch, what I what I listen to. When I'm not in the word, when I'm not in that foundation, seeing who I am, beholding the, the glory of God through the, through His word, I, I, I fall apart. And it's very evident. So it's very evident in most Christians' lives that they're not reading the Word. And it's evident because we come up with all these weird doctrines like, God works in mysterious ways. No, He doesn't. No, He doesn't. He's revealed Himself to us through Christ, the Bible says. So, I want to get real with you guys. I just want to get real. And you know what? If I, if, I, if, I didn't, if I didn't say this, I wouldn't love you. Okay, if I just kind of shied away from this, said, you know what? If you're not reading your Word, it's okay. You know, we'll just sweep that under the rug. That would be disrespect to you. As a pastor, as a brother in Christ, as a friend. Okay? But because um, the, God has placed me here, and I love you, I have to tell you the truth. If you're not in the Word, make it a point to get in the Word. It is absolutely crucial. 
It is absolutely crucial, especially now and today. I mean, it always has been crucial, but now and today, because there's so many lies out there, so many just garbage out there that people fall into, Christians fall into, because they don't have any, they won't even crack this, but to listen to all the lies and the deceit, and it's, it's, it's painful to see. So, <clears throat> here are some excuses of why people don't read the Word. I don't have time. When I'm busy, that's no excuse. That's absolutely no excuse. No. I mean, I don't even, that's not even worth addressing. <laughs> you know, I get busy. I get very busy, but I can make time for the Word. I can make time for the Word. You can. You wake up in the morning, even if you're just reading half a chapter or a verse, like I said, you know, you can do it. It's, it is very possible. If you make it a priority, it just depends. If you don't have time for the Word, that means it's not important to you. That means it's not a priority. It means other things are. Make it a priority. See, I'm showing the importance of reading the Word, and you can make a shift today. Today, I encourage you, make that shift. Make the Word of God your priority, your, your foundation. So, another excuse is, I'll let the preacher read it for me. That, that again, is a lame, lame excuse, okay? He reads, I, I mean, I come to church, that's, my, that's, what I, that's when I hear the Word. That's my time for the Word. You know what that's like? That's like if you're by a big, huge river, just a river of living water, and you walk up to it. And this is for someone who just hears the Word once a week by a preacher. It's like just taking your toe and sticking it in the river and be like, oh, okay, I'm good, I'm good. I'll, I'll come back and stick my toe in next week. No, no, you've got to say, I'm jumping into the river. I'm just jumping in the river of living water. Get it into the Word. And this is living water. It is life to us. It says in, in Proverbs that the Word of God is life and health to all our flesh. To all our flesh. Even reading the Word produces life and health. Thinking on the Word produces life and health. It's powerful. No other book can do that. No other book can do that. If you read it and actually think about it. I don't understand it. That's another excuse. Now that's that's probably the, um, the excuse I might buy. Because I, <laughs> I don't understand it. You know what? I don't fully understand the word. Every bit of it. He has given me an understanding on a lot of it. And given you an understanding on a lot of it. But you know what? That's not a legitimate excuse. The holy. What happens is when you read the word... The Holy Spirit is what makes it alive in you. You're not going to understand it with your natural mind. It says that this, this is foolishness to people of the world. That they won't understand it. They think it's just, they think it's crazy. But what, they, what they're in is crazy. To us, the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and actually makes it alive to us. See, that's why it says the Word of God is living and active. Two things. <clears throat> it's alive. Okay, for example, the Word of God is living and active. For example, the very first, you know, some of the first words He spoke. God said, let there be light. Okay, He was not describing light. His word light was light. Now that may boggle the mind to think about. Because when I say light, light is not coming out of my mouth, right? Mm -hmm. I'm describing light. But when God said light, light came out of His mouth. It's alive. So His word is exactly what He says it is. It's alive and it's active. His word is doing exactly what it, it, it describes. So when you're reading this, when you're applying it to your life, it's living and active. That's powerful to think about. It's very powerful to think about. Okay, I'm not saying, you, know, you guys know very well that I'm not saying God is mad at you if you're not reading your Bible. You guys know I've, this whole year I've been teaching, that has been my whole point. This God has got a smile on His face towards you. You are His beloved son or daughter with whom He is well pleased. Why? If you've received Jesus, you've received Him. Okay? But what I am saying is, if you're not in the Word, you will live a defeated Christian life. Like, like the most Christians out here. You will be guessing, wondering, what's God's will? What's going on? What, what, what should I expect? You'll be tossed to and fro, says the book of James. You'll... you'll You'll be battling when you don't have to battle. He's already won the battle. You'll be living like everyone else in the world. But when we're, when we're in the Word of God, we have that foundation. And when we're not in the Word of God, you know what? We're easily deceived. We're very easily deceived. And it does say that many will fall away from the faith in the end times. Why? Because most Christians don't read the Word. American Christians. There is people who, who, will, who, who just would die to have this whole book. 
Some only have pages of this book, like over in China, like and things like that, third world countries. They 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 would they would literally die to give other people this book, the whole book. They have like pages and things like that, or just copies of the New Testament, things like that. So take advantage of this awesome, awesome book. <clears throat> so the Bible isn't just information. Okay? It's it's living and active. And we, there's there's a lot of things we do with this word. We read the word. That's 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 not all we do with it. That's not all. That's just the tip of the iceberg. We read the word. We meditate on the word. We've talked about what meditating on the word is, and it's not some Eastern thing. We're like, oh, it's not that type of meditation. <laughs> meditating is applying thought to the word. Okay, that's that's basically what it is. Applying thought to the word of God. So, an example of meditation. Would be a, a verse I've been meditating on a lot lately is Ephesians 3.19. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I've been taking each individual word and actually applying thought to each individual word. To know, I started thinking on that. To know, to experience, to, to, to not just have information but to actually experience the love. I started thinking on the love of God. How He loved us. Jesus on the cross. Him paying for my sins. In him delivering me from the hands of the enemy. To know the love of Christ, which passes, I think of it, you know, passing like a like on the expressway, passing someone, you're just going super fast, which passes knowledge. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Uh, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So begin to think on those words. Think on those words. Filled with fullness. How can you be filled with fullness? That's as full as you can possibly be. Filled with the fullness of God. Filled with His fullness. So His love fills me with His fullness. And just thinking on it like that, that's an example of meditating on the Word. Now it wouldn't be that fast and sporadic, but you're, here's the main point. You're applying thought to the Word. You're thinking on it. So many people just read it, and they just, I got my daily reading done. I'm good. <clears throat> we read the Word, we meditate the Word, think the Word. We hear the Word. That's important. Hearing the word is very important. Hearing yourself speak the word or hearing others speak the word. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God actually produces faith. The word of God actually has faith in it. So when you hear the word, it will produce faith. So, and then lastly, it's doing the word. When you've thought on the word, spoke the word, um, meditate on the word, it'll actually produce the doing of the word. A lot of people, a lot of people try to do the word without thinking the word, and it is backwards. It is not good. If the word isn't root, if the word is not rooted in you and you try to do it, I mean it'll just be religious. But if the word is rooted in you, you'll want to do it. You no, nothing could stop you from being a doer of the word, not just a hearer only, like it says in James. So, I encourage you to get on a daily reading plan. I do not want to say, okay, here's the daily reading plan that you have to have. Get on a daily reading plan. Now, here's what I would like to say, because um, <clears throat> I would encourage you to start in the New Testament. Start in the book of Matthew. A lot of people say start in the book of John. Just, just start, start in the New Testament. Start with one of the Gospels. I would encourage you to do that. Because what happens is when you don't have a foundation of the New Covenant, and you go to the Old Covenant, and you read about how God... When he brought judgment on people, when he had the law, that's where the mixed covenant comes in a lot of times. A lot of new believers will mix covenants. Now, if you want to read the Old Testament, that's awesome. The Old Testament, I'm not saying it's bad. It's not at all. It's the Word of God. It all points to Jesus, but unfortunately, a lot of people still think they're under the Old Covenant. And it's very clear we're not. The Apostle Paul says we have a better covenant. Okay? So I want to encourage you, if you have not been reading the Word, you, you just don't know where to start, I want to encourage you to start in the book of John. That's, that's probably the best place to start. And maybe just, if you're like, well, I don't know, how much should I read, this and that, just start with a chapter a day, or have a chapter, or even a verse. But if you make it a daily, a daily occurrence, you will build a habit on that. You will build, uh, um, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll get to the point where you need it. Where you absolutely need it. And you'll see it, and you'll see your life changing. You will. You truly will. Um, so that's what we have for today. Is, is I want to encourage you in that. Daily reading of the Word. And I'm not going to 
by any means, if you're not reading the Word, condemn you. But I will correct you. Okay? I will definitely correct you in that. Because I would not be a good pastor if I didn't say, reading the Word is important. You know? So, you may be thinking, well, maybe, or yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to buckle down and I'm going to do it. Let's do it together. Okay, let's do it together. Let's keep each other accountable. Let's keep each other encouraged and get into the Word. All right, so because this church is going to continue to grow because of God's grace, we are a Bible-based church. We're not a religious-based church. The Word of God is, is not religious. All right, so let's go ahead and get into prayer.